please welcome the host of Security Sidebar, John Wagnon. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and good night, depending on where you are watching this thing. So it's great to see you. I'm John. This is Security Sidebar, Dev Central live stream, and we get to connect with all of you, the Dev Central community. So I'm excited to be here. And uh, as we always do, I would encourage you to chat with us. So if you're on YouTube or LinkedIn or Facebook or you know all the places, uh, post some comments out there and we'll, uh, we'll interact live today. So uh, anyway, hey, so today we have an awesome uh, lineup, an awesome show. We're going to be talking about digital as default, like everything's going digital, right? And specifically, what are some of the security implications related to everything going digital? So I am excited to welcome uh, my guest today, Miss Lori McVitie. She's the Principal Technical Evangelist um, out of the office of the CTO here at F5. So let's all give a warm welcome to Miss Lori McVitie. And there she is. Lori, I just gotta I just gotta assume that everyone's out there clapping, like standing ovation I, right now. I was just thinking that, like, oh like, yeah. We need, <laughs> a, right. we need a like laugh track or you know, the fifties that like clapping and laugh tracks for the show. Yes. Yeah. Yes, Definitely. just you know, introduce that. I just in my mind, I can just picture you know, raging crowds just going crazy. You know, the crowds going wild. Good deal. Hey, so thanks for being here, man. It's great to great to see you and uh, and have this little conversation about digital as default. So this is going to be a lot of fun. I, you know, when you suggested it, I thought it would be. So I'm glad to be here. I'm glad you had me back after the last time. Tells me I didn't yep. go far enough. I'll I'll try this time. <laughs> see if I can. <laughs> do every, do everything you can to get kicked off to get kicked off the show. Can it's that's going to be hard. That's it's, <laughs> is it hard? Okay, it's hard to do. It's hard. So hey, maybe try. You will never. You never know. You know things could get kind of crazy today. That's All awesome. Right. Well, good deal. Well, hey, so we'll jump into this whole digital as default, you know, conversation. So, you know, everybody's talking about this digital transformation. That's the big buzzword, you know, digital transformation, this and that. But, in, you know, inevitably, as everyone shifts to, to transform to everything digital, then it inevitably means that everything by default is going to be digital. And I was just thinking really quick, and I'll let you give some examples or whatever, um, I, I was thinking about what are some things in my life that have not been digital in the past, but now I almost demand that they are digital. Um, and I mean, there's things like, you know, a bank statement. It's like, do not send me a paper. If, if my bank, if you send me a paper bank statement, then I'm just going to go crazy. Um, but then even like at the, at the store, when I check out, you know, I go to the, like the local hardware store and they're like, Hey, do you want a print e or a print receipt or an email? And I'm like, do not give me a print receipt. I'm just, I'm either going to throw it away or I'm going to lose it, you know? So email it to me. Right. Um, but there are many other things. So maybe I was going to see if you could take a minute and talk about like what this whole digital transformation thing is and how, you know, how things have gone just digital as default. Wow. Well, you kind of just did. I mean, it is, right? Well, you, you know, I mean, digital transformation is a great hashtag and everybody talks about it in these broad sweeping terms and, and here's what you have to do and here's your five step plan and how do you know where you are? Um, but, you know, they forget that, I mean, really at its at its core, digital transformation is about a business journey. Right? So it's yep. a business going digital because, I mean, just throwing up a website never you know, it didn't really, it didn't give you a way to to buy things, purchase things, interact, get service, right? That wasn't, that was digital, but it was just the beginnings. And mm -hmm. by default, I, it's, it's a mindset shift, right? It's the way that we think about all of the things in our world. When I was a kid, right, my mom had these index cards and she kept her recipes on them. And that's how we shared them with other people, right? Now mm -hmm. we have, you know, bookmarks in a browser. Right. That's yep. where I get my latest recipe. When I share it, I just send somebody a link in a text message. Right. Yep. Christmas cards. I still send them out because I'm old. I, I don't care. That's <laughs> tough. Right? I'm going to send a Christmas card. My kids don't. Right. Birthday. Hmm. It doesn't matter what it is. They send a text. They use cute emojis or they send me a meme, but it's still a text. It's digital. They default to that. And that's really what that means is that as consumers, as society, as as people, we're tending to default to the digital option before we go dig up that phone book that might be hiding in the closet that's five years old, but might help find us a plumber, right? That's, yeah. that's where we're at. It's now the last option, not the first option. So as default means we're defaulting to it, which means, of course, that it's driving demand for it. 
So businesses are going to try and do it. And that's where we see that digital transformation coming into play. Business knows it needs to provide services digitally. And that's yep. going to be the default in the future. Yeah. I mean, it makes perfect sense. You know, it's uh, everyone's moving that direction. So like the, you know, I think about like uh, my parents, grandparents, or, you know, whatever they're, they're like, oh, you know, no one sends a handwritten note anymore. And it's like, no, they don't. You know, you're lucky if they send you letters in the English language. Now it's just emojis and that's it, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> right. Well, even so. in our lifetimes, right? I, right. I grew up playing tabletop D and D, right? I mean, that's right. dice paper, right? Yeah. I still have my yeah. dice either right on my there desk you go. because, right, it's gone digital. Yeah. Right? And, yep. and the pandemic kind of accelerated that, but everything, right? The entire gaming experience is now online and digital. You don't need dice. You don't need paper. You just need to come and have your your laptop, and boom, you're, you know, you're storming the castle. Go get them. <laughs> you know? That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's it's fascinating the way that things have you know shifted, just like you said, in our lifetime, just in and not a not a long period of time. Hey, so I was I was going to pop up one of these uh, one of these slides that you had presented back at uh, Blackout, which was awesome, by the way. So let me let me pop this up, and it talks about uh, the this, the kind of that move to digital. There's there's just the kind of the basic task automation, but then you get into expansion and then and then this crazy thing called AI, right? This artificial intelligence stuff. So I was wondering if you could kind of walk us through a little bit of, of that progression of what that looks like. What does that look like? Yes, there are three phases to digital transformation, right? As a business is moving through this. And this actually started, right? I mean, before most of us were in technology, right? Task automation is really, I'm going to make an application to do this thing, right? Whether, and then those were apps. And we've been delivering them for, for many years. Task automation, manual processes get turned into an application, right? That results in more code because you're writing more apps. The second phase where a lot of organizations are today is really about expanding that. Well, how do I expand that presence online? How do I connect and have automatic payments? How do I get a product catalog? How do I integrate with Amazon so that I get more sellers and I can go global, right? It's about expanding the digital services that you're offering because people are demanding it. Um, and that is creating more connections between clouds, between apps, between businesses, consumers. It's crazy out there. And as they move into that last phase, uh, it's really about taking all the data that's generated from the previous phases and going, wow, I can start automating things. I can start understanding my business in a new way because no one measures foot traffic anymore. That's traditionally how you measured your customer base, right? Click, mm. click, click. 20 people came through today. Great. You know, now <laughs> it's, it's clicks on the website, right? It's about the yep. data. So, and of course, right, the more data and the more digital you are, the more data you're generating. So in that phase, you're really generating even more data. So we have a lot of mores. There's more code, there's more connections, there's more data. That's the kind of the consequences of becoming digital. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's it's one of those. It's a consequence. It's the, you know, it's a blessing and a curse. Um, yeah. So, you know, this this AI stuff, you know, inevitably you're going to have to go there, you know, as a business. Like you said, there's all this data. And one of the things that's fascinating to me, too, is that, you know, you get all of this crazy amount of data coming in, but you need to do something with that, you know, instead of just swimming in this ocean of data. Mm -hmm. And that's where AI really comes into play as well. I mean, there's a lot of stuff with AI, but that's one of the things. And I think I've, I heard you talking about one time that like the human brain can only process like so many bits of you know information per second or whatever it was. Um, about 60, yeah, about 60 about, bits of information per second. Yeah, that's all. Yeah. Although my wife would probably argue that my brain is more in like the teens, you know, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think teenagers are like that too. They process about one bit a second from anyone who is their parent. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. It's, yeah. It's got that's kind right. of a, they've got a firewall, right? That's just like blocking <laughs> everything else. Not happening. It's not happening, man. Even if, yeah, as much as you want it to, it's not, it's not it's happening. Not, it's not. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, so that brings in this whole AI, this need for AI. And, you know, it, frankly, it's not that hard to understand that, hey, there's data everywhere today and you're going to need some kind of artificial intelligence or some kind of machine learning, you know, assistance to process through all this stuff. Um, 
But one of the things that that I wanted to talk about too is, you know, as we move to this whole digital, you know, as default, everything's, you know, uh, bits and bytes and all that stuff. Um, then it brings up this whole security thing. I mean, this is, you know, this whole security sidebar, you know, discussion today. So I know that uh, I know that you've talked about different layers of ways that attackers can attack, you know, in this new digital world that we live in. And so <clears throat> I was going to bring that up really quick and maybe have you have you explain to us like what what are all these things and how do they work? So let me let me pop this up if that's OK. That's well, it's okay. You already did. You didn't let me answer first, John. You just did. Um, I'm sorry, so Lori. Now we're going to talk about you know the layers. And yeah. really, the reason that I abstracted into three layers is because there is so much. There's there is so many different attack surfaces now. I mean, as you go digital, right? If you're putting everything online and you're building more stuff to be online and you're connecting with more people online. It, there are just so many, so many problems, right? So yep. if you step back, abstract it, right? You've got really the code, really code is about the app. So you've got mm -hmm. app problems, secrets that are detected per day, this Git Guardian report. Wow. I mean, it was terrifying. Uh, the number of secrets that are stored out in, you know, repos that shouldn't be there. Hmm. But there's coding mm -hmm. errors, there's platform vulnerabilities, there's right logic vulnerabilities. Right. There's just yep. a lot of a lot of problems in code that is a threat to the business and to the consumers. And you look, but don't forget the infrastructure. Right. Let's not forget you still need infrastructure. Apps don't run on you know unicorn rainbows. I mean, there's right. there's hardware and resources and platforms and networks underneath it that have yep. to support it. And in that case, here's where you get into volumetric DDoS attacks. There's protocol manipulation. There's amplification mm -hmm. attacks. These still happen. Right. Our yeah. own research right, found that, uh, you know, more than 50 percent of attacks are using many of these vectors mm -hmm. to come at you. Um, yep. So you have to protect that. And now at the business, this is this is kind of the new piece, right? The fraud, the, you know, credential stuffing, the the malware, the ransomware, the nastyware. That's what I'm just calling it. It's just all nastyware. And it's it's a threat to the business because a lot of times it's attacking things that you can't avoid having. You have to have mm -hmm. a login. You have to have a way for people to identify themselves. It's going to get abused. There's an attack there and we have to learn how to protect against that. So, you know, we're we're kind of in the situation where there are three distinct attack layers in this digital security stack um, yep. and we have to do a better job of protecting all of them. Absolutely. So, you know, I think it's interesting, too, that there are, you know, I, I appreciate you kind of abstracting this into three different layers. It kind of gives you three different places to look and focus some efforts and energy and all that and maybe organize your thoughts a little bit, too. Um, but also you, you had mentioned that, you know, if you need to go to your leadership or whatever, then it's like, OK, we can kind of we can focus on this thing or that. It just kind of organizes things better, which is nice. Um, and maybe maybe a couple of questions I had about this. I've just thought, you know, as, as different businesses are out there doing their thing, you know, um, then on that first layer, that that application layer, you've got coding errors. Like you said, there's there's secret, all the things you just mentioned. And there's so many dependencies that people have, you know, on code that other people write. Right. And it's uh, and it's, you know, I, I don't I don't have my own little coding team over here that does absolutely everything that I ever touch and deal with. Right. So I'm I'm dependent on other people's stuff. Is there any advice that you might give or, you know, um, things that you might say on how you deal with that from a security perspective? Wow. Um Hmm. And I, yeah. I, I know we didn't talk about that one, really. That, I'm, I'm kind of throwing you. That, throwing wasn't, you that wasn't on the pre show yeah. list. I don't know. I know. Uh, no. No, I mean, one, you know, I mean, I wish I could say just don't depend on other people's code because right. you don't know where it's been, but you have yeah. to. Um, yep. you, know, you really do. You have to. And even if you even if you were to write all your own code for your things, yep. you still have to depend on code that's in someone's payment processor. Right. That's I, right. You don't do that yourself. So you are always going to be dependent. So, you know, I think there's a you have to start being more aware and having discussions um, and digging into right. What are their security practices? Yep. Right? Are, yep. are you doing at least this minimum, you know, X things mm -hmm. so that we can feel confident? You know, you are doing what you can to protect us as well as yourselves. 
exactly so checklist, right? And build it into the dev process, right? I mean, if you're not practicing SDLC, if you're not, you know, integrating this stuff into the the dev pipeline, making sure that you're actually, you know, finding these problems and then fixing them. Um, I think that's the big thing. A lot of people see the errors and don't actually fix them. They're like, yeah, we'll get that later. Or eh, ops will get that in production. Doesn't happen that way, right? Fix it in the code is, yep. is the best way to do it. Yeah, and I and I remember you saying some stats as well about just old vulnerabilities that are still out there. I mean, you go back to 2015 or you know whatever, pick a year, right? Back into the you know back into oh, yeah. Windows Windows 3.1 with the blue screen of death, whatever. It's like it's still out there, right? So it's yeah, people are just not necessarily patching things or fixing things quickly. So yeah, and and I know, right? We we've kind of not had a lot of discussions about patch management lately because people yeah. were, I think, fatigued, right? Because you get them, right? I mean, it's you know, it's a thing on Twitter, right? Oh, it's Patch Tuesday, right? Now we have all our security patches; they come out, and we have Patch Friday from some other company, and people are overwhelmed. But it's critical, right, to make sure that those are getting, you know, installed, they're getting updated, they're getting put into place, because you know. You, no one is immune anymore from attacks. No, 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 no. absolutely not. <clears throat> I know you mentioned like on the uh, on the infrastructure layer, the like the DDoS attacks, and I've I've had a chance to talk to some of the Silverline SOC guys, you know, here at F five that do all of the you know keeping everybody safe, and they're seeing attacks every day. And you're right, I don't remember ever talking to them where someone just used one attack vector, like, hey, I'm going to use a DNS amplification, and that's it, you know, and not touch NTP or CLDAP or you know, a sin flood or whatever. It's just, you know, when a DDoS comes in, if you're the attacker, you're like, I'm sending the whole thing, you know, because um, why not? Right. It's, right. It's uh, like, yeah. The bad guys are like packaging these up. Like, here's our special on our, you know, three, three attacks <laughs> for a dollar or five for you right. know, two. I mean, you can go out and get these and and kids are doing this. I mean, you know, video games, you wouldn't think this is a significant DDoS, you know, environment, but it is because today there's competitive esports. Money is on the line, egos, pride is on the line, and uh, fans are just as bad as football fans. They are, you know, they are zealous. They love their players, and you know, just recently, the end of a season in Fortnite, there was all sorts of, you know, talk about don't share this information because people are planning to DDoS these other teams in order to give the other team an advantage because performance and lag, right, lag kills. Right? Oh, yeah. so this is an industry where you would not normally associate DDoS attacks, but it's common across a lot of esports that angry players, angry fans will go and actually just, you know, click the button three for a dollar. Go get them. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. Nuts. Hey, don't don't be messing with someone's Fortnite game, I guess. Right. It's uh, that's serious business. Serious business, man. It's crazy. Yeah. Gotta I mean, but get that win. <laughs> that's right. But that's the world we live in. Right. So it it's uh, it man, is. what a what an amazing thing. Well, hey, so I know, you you know, we've talked about, hey, everything's moving to digital, you know, everything's uh, all that. And then there's these different abstracted kind of layers, the, inf the application, the infrastructure, um, you know, the business itself, that whole thing. Um, and so but I wanted to I wanted to kind of have this third little discussion about the things we could do about it. So it's not all bad news, right? There's some good news here. There's some ways we can step in front of this or try to help, you know, protect all this stuff. So I wanted to pop up this uh, this this last slide that we could kind of talk through. And I wondered okay. if you could kind of talk talk to us talk to us about the different ways we could, you know, attack this or, you know, help protect things. Yeah, there's always a scissors, right? I mean, just cut yourself off, right? I mean, that's like the, the last resort. Yeah. Um, better options for dealing with a, a digital uh, digital you know attack world that we live in, right? At the code level, right, DevSecOps, it's not just a buzzword. It's not just a movement, right? It's a set of practices that can really help prevent things like, you know, coding errors, secrets from being, you know, shared out in public to patch mm -hmm. platform vulnerabilities, to detect, you know, container images that are out of date or contain vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things are, are part of that whole DevSecOps kind of approach and that practice that integrates it into the pipeline. And it's something that you can do to really improve, you know, the security of your application. And when you look at infrastructure, 
Sorry, um, TCP is still TCP, IP is still IP. You're not going to change the protocols. DNS still needs to be open because that's how the internet works. So you're yep. stuck with these. You're going to have to defend against all these kinds of right, infrastructure protocol-based attacks. And because they are distributed, a distributed defense is going to be your best option because you need to protect not just the assets and where they are, but also against where those attacks are coming. And the best defense is always to stop the attack as close to the origin as possible, right? Mm -hmm. If you're trying to stop Attila the Hunt, well, you want to get him before he's inside the city, I'm guessing. I've seen right. movies. You don't right. want him inside your defenses, right? right? So stop it early. So distributed defense is going to be your best bet, especially as you're starting to distribute apps and, you know, and, and services as well. So you're going to want to keep those together. Mm -hmm. um, Lastly, you're going to need some AI. You're going to need some smart stuff to be able to look at behavior, to be able to um, very quickly pull together a multitude of characteristics about the network, about devices, about you know the, the software that's being used, um, the network, the location, everything. Pull that all together and analyze it very quickly to say, this is a legitimate user, this is not. And I'm not just talking about bots. It could be a person who is not a legitimate user, right? Mm -hmm. I do not log in from any place outside of my home right now. Right. So if you're getting a login from, you know, France, I mean, as much, nice as that might be, it's not me, you know, so right. hey, stop it. Um, think right. even something simple like that. And it gets, right, it gets more complicated than that down to behaviors, mouse movements, right? We can differentiate between automated scripts and people based on how they're moving their mouse on a CAPTCHA. Um, mm -hmm. It's really amazing. Well, I shouldn't say we can, right? The machines can. And so right. we need to leverage <laughs> that to be able to help us to um, stop abuse of things like logins and password resets and detect malware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's critical. It's like we said before, you know, there's only so much the human brain can do. You gotta, you gotta step into the AI assistance very quickly, you know, yeah. so. Um, but, you know, I guess the good news is, is that, yeah, there are things we can do. You know, you shift left and shield right kind of thing. Those yes. are some of the buzzwords you'll hear. And, and uh, you know, protect the application and, you know, at the edge and just all those different things. Right. And uh, but the application is is the king. And it's like, hey, you got to you got to protect that where it lives. But it's distributed. Like you said, it's not just like this, this really well-defined perimeter anymore. Right. They li It lives kind of everywhere, it seems like. Right. Yes. So, yes. It's, yeah, all, it's yeah, all over the place. Trust no one. Trust nothing. Trust no one. Trust no one. Like I said, get the scissors. I mean, there are days. Right? Yeah. <laughs> That's it. Can't deal yep. with it anymore. It feels like that, but it doesn't have to be that overwhelming because there are approaches you can take. Um, yeah. And that's part of the reason of kind of stepping back and looking at it in those different layers is being able to <laughs> apply the right solution to yeah. the right problem. So, you know, don't, don't apply DevSecOps to, you know, to a network problem that's probably yeah. right that's not necessarily going to work right 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 yep yeah. yep it's uh you know have the right tool for the right problem you know and, and they're out there and that's good that's good well hey really quick there was a question that came in from bonnie out there on youtube and i thought i wondered if you had a uh, had a thought on here so so bonnie bayek first of all good to see you my friend um Transitioning from a network security background, how do you how do you switch on over to to the uh, to the great world of DevSecOps? So, anyway, any any thoughts on that, Lori? By chance? That no, that's a great question, right? I mean, that is a great question because there's a need for that, right? Mm -hmm. DevSecOps is, implies right. There's a lot of well, developers will become security folks. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm just going to leave that right there. So right. Right, you need people with security, right? Security know-how and expertise to be able to provide that to developers. So moving over there, I mean, a lot of the, the network security, I mean, we call DevSecOps and the CICD uh, process a pipeline because it's like a network, right? There is, there's hops in it where, um, you know, where code flows through as it's being built and released and tested. I mean, there's a lot of the same processes and there's a lot of the same issues. Like there's a vulnerability here and it needs to be patched and there's 
um, you know, a test that needs to be run there. And, you know, we need to look at the results. So I think trying to transition over is a lot of, of stepping up a little bit and looking at it from a process perspective and how it's flowing through and where you can fit into that. Um, a lot of what we call network security is is a lot of know-how about protocols and how people interact with applications and traffic and what it looks like. And there's not a lot of expertise on the dev side, um, you know, in terms of, right, what does it look like on the network? So I think you can start applying that into those processes to be able to go, look, you know, this is how this might work, or this is how, where we can insert it the most efficiently. This is the most efficient solution for it. This is something that we can address in, as, in part of the network security, and this is what we can. Just making that distinction is huge. What can you address in the app? What can't you? And being mm. able to you know, direct that is, is a huge bonus. Yeah, I think that's fantastic. No, so I mean, you know, the network security background has a has a great place, you know, in DevSecOps. But like you said, it's it's a it's a process. It's a, it's like a network in and of itself. It's a it's a mindset. And so I think that yeah, the more you can bring to that team that that mindset, that process is uh, is really really good. So awesome. No, I, I appreciate you uh, giving some thoughts on that. Um, well, hey, one other one other quick thing I wanted to talk about. I know we're man, we're almost out of time. Lori, these things always go by so fast. It's like, what just happened? They do. You know? They do. Now, okay. admittedly, my brain does process what did I say? Like in the teens bit per second or whatever. So, you know, maybe maybe I'm a little slow. So I don't know. Um, but hey, one of the things that we do here at F5 is we try to gather a lot of statistics, a lot of data. You know, we talked about data and all that stuff, right? And how to process it and, and deal with it, whatever. But we try to we try to gain insight from the industry. And so I know you're you're a key part of this uh, state of application strategy survey that goes out every year. And I know, I think it's out. Did it just go out? But I, I was wondering if if, uh, if you could spend a couple of minutes on like what that is and how people might be able to help. Yes. Yes. We're in our eighth year, ninth year, eighth year. Nice. It's, it's gone by so fast. Um, right. We just launched it live. So it's the state of app strategy for 2022. And mm -hmm. we have um, we have links on all of the social properties and we're trying to get people to you know, to give us their opinions, their thoughts, their, you know, their current practices, so we can better understand everything from security to edge, to cloud, to app portfolios, to, right, how they're using data and how they want to use data. Um, there's a lot of mix of what are you doing and how do you want to be doing it? Because uh, mm -hmm. it's not enough just to say, oh, well, X people are doing this. It's like, that's nice, but do they want to be doing it that way? So we also have a lot of questions where it's more, we want to hear your opinions because this, this survey is more than just like my favorite thing because I get to write blogs and talk about it for a year. Um, right. It also, right, it informs our understanding of, right, what, what the market is saying, what the industry is saying, what people are actually doing. Uh, it's really hard to get that. We can't talk to everybody. Uh, so this is one of the ways that we, you know, give basically, you know, the enterprise a voice um, mm -hmm. that lets us understand, you know, what we should be doing, what we should be doing differently, what we shouldn't be doing, um, how we should be doing it, you know, I mean, all those kind of things. So it's a great resource for providing us feedback and also for, you know, for us to be able to understand what's really going on out there. Right. Should yeah. The, the real it. answer it, please, please. For me. Yes, please. Every, everyone. Lori, Lori's going to cry if you don't. You know, remember, remember that that raucous crowd that was applauding at the beginning? All of you, all of you take the survey. Um, good deal. Hey, and then for those. Uh, so, again, just to kind of reiterate, this is not a closed survey for only certain businesses or companies or whatever. It's open to everybody. So everybody get out there and take it. Mm -hmm. um, and then two, if you are one of the uh, one of the people that is watching this later on YouTube and you're like, hey, the thing already passed and I couldn't take it that year. Um, Lori, I know you said you're in like your eighth or whatever year. It, it mm -hmm. This thing keeps coming back every year. Right. So if someone yes. watches this mm -hmm. later and it's like ah, they can catch the next one. Is that true? That that is true. I mean, we, we plan on doing this every year for as long as we can. So yeah. every September yeah. we, we ask you to help us, please. And yeah, in September, it's like that Earth, Wind and Fire song. You know, do you remember the state of application strategy in September? You know, maybe we can come up with a new song, right? <laughs> I, you, you lost me there, John. I'm going to admit yeah. it. You lost me there. 
I, you know, I tried to do too many things right there. There, there's a there's a classic Earth, Wind, and Fire song that's a, the singing group, and they were like, "Do you remember the 21st day of September?" Um, anyway, anyway, I uh, I'm I, gonna I, look I it up crazy. now. I'm, I'll look Lord, it up. <laughs> you know, I think this is maybe the third time I've mentioned. My brain doesn't work very quickly, so you know, I probably uh, probably just you know did some crazy stuff there. Good to go, man. Well, Lori, hey, it has been an absolute pleasure. I know like we're at time and it's it seems like this goes by way too fast, but I really appreciate you being here and everything you do for F5 and just the whole community in general, really. So, uh, so man, it's great to see you today. All right. Well, thank you. I'm, I'm always excited to come on and talk to people and answer questions. So anytime. Awesome, man. Thanks so much, Lori. Have a great day. You All right. Well, Lori McVitie, man, what an awesome, awesome, just, you know, person in the office of the CTO doing amazing things for all the, you know, everything at F5, but also just for the community in general, like we said, uh, just a wealth of knowledge. So I really appreciate Lori. And as we as we close out this show today, I did want to tease a couple of uh, shows that we've got coming up. So um, here in the next uh, next couple of weeks, Next week, we have the Dev Central Connect show. Times, they are a-changing. So um, it's going to be fun to, to kind of get into that. We've got some new and exciting things coming up here on Dev Central. Uh, so we'd love, we're excited to, to share those with you. Uh, and then after that, we've got uh, Dev Central Connects again, the Digital Engagement Center Lab Framework. So that's going to be a lot of fun to talk about that. Um, and then going into the month of October, October is the uh, Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So we've got a lot of fun stuff, a lot of exciting content, uh, you know, in, in place for that. So we're excited to share that with all of you. Uh, so like we like we uh, do every time, uh, make sure you subscribe, smash that subscribe button, and and get notified, and you'll uh, you'll know when we go live or when we post new content to our YouTube channel, things like that. Um, and so with that, I will say this has been an amazing security sidebar show. It's been a lot of fun just to dig into the digital as default uh, and uh, talk about all the security stuff related to that. Um, so to you, the Dev Central community, I say thank you for being the greatest uh, online technical community in the world. Um, you are uh, the reason that we do what we do. So it's a lot of fun to, to be a part of this. So, uh, so thanks again for being here today and we will see you next time.